Sermon on the Mount, our Lord's words to his disciples as he began his ministry. Today, everybody wants to be happy. Everybody's pursuing happiness. And uh, we in our country have a label for that. It's called the American Dream. My question, though, is could it be that that's just all it is? It's a dream. I mean, the fact that we, we chase after it and, and how many really find that, uh, Amer you know, the American dream. I mean, what about the, the person, the soul of the person who chases that pot uh, of gold at the end of the rainbow? What happens to them is the proposition that if you get rich and you get prominent and you have power, that you will have happiness or satisfaction as many people pursue. Well, let's, let's run with that for just a moment. Let's run with that proposition that if you do that, you'll, get, you'll have complete satisfaction. Let's pretend that you are one of 10, you're the 11th, one of 10 of the world's most powerful financiers, people, money people, in all of the world who met at the Edgewater Beach Motel, Hotel in Chicago in 1923. This was an, an incredible array of people. I mean, tycoons, money people of all different walks. And, that, and you're the 11th person. And so here you go. In this historical meeting, you have with you here people who have you know, climbed the successful ladder. They've been there. You have someone such as um, the president of a large independent steel company, the president of the National City Bank, the president of a large utility company. Next to him sits the distinguished president of a large gas company. Others taking their places around the conference table are the, the president of the New York Stock Exchange, uh, a great wheat speculator, a well-known leader of Wall Street, uh, a member of the president's cabinet, the head of the world's largest monopoly, and, the, and finally the president of the Bank of International Settlements, and you're there. What a heady group. And the discussion evolves around uh, yachts, uh, elaborate, uh, exotic vacations, exclusive memberships, and all these finances, money, dollar signs that just kind of covers and hovers over the, this boardroom. These are people who not only have chased that, that pot at the end of the rainbow, they have found that pot. In fact, they own the rainbow. I mean, they have it all. They've been there. They've got it. So you would think that they would be happy by now, right? And yet, 25 years later, where are they, you might ask? Hmm. Well, let me tell you. The president of the large independent steel company died bankrupt having lived on borrowed money for the last five years of his life. The president of the great utility company died a fugitive from justice and penniless in a foreign land. The president of the large gas company went completely insane. The president of the New York Stock Exchange was released from Sing Sing Penitentiary. The member of the president's cabinet was pardoned so that he could die at home. The great wheat speculator died abroad, insolvent. The great leader in the Wall Street died a suicide. The president of the Bank of International Settlements died a suicide. Huh. So apparently that pot at the end of the rainbow was empty. It certainly didn't give them satisfaction. I think Billy Graham had the answer to this dilemma. Billy Graham said, I have searched the world over my travels for, content, for contented and happy men. I have found that such men only where Christ has personally and decisively been received. There is only one uh, permanent way to have peace of soul that wells up in joy and contentment and happiness, and that is by repentance of sin and personal faith in Jesus Christ our Savior. Perhaps that's why C.S. Lewis in his book Mere Christianity said, just as, as, as an automobile runs on gas, so we have been so made to run on God. He said, his spirit 
is that which we drink of. We are to live by, uh, uh, on God. And so he said, C.S. Lewis said, there's no way to find happiness or to discuss happiness outside of God. God can't make you happy. People often say, why doesn't God make me happy? He can't make you happy apart from him. Because we have been made to run on him. And that was a, that's the point that as our Lord speaks to these people, on the beginning of his ministry, he is saying, listen, people who have been oppressed by not only the, the, the Romans, but the Grecians, and the Grecians who were extremely harsh and cruel, but the Romans, not as harsh and cruel, were more dominant. And so these are people who have, again, who have been oppressed, and they're looking for satisfaction, they're looking for joy, they're looking for happiness. And so they think that the Messiah, as they look for the Messiah, they think that he's going to come and usher in a political and millennial, a political and I should say military kingdom. And Jesus says, that's not where it is. The Sermon on the, on the Mount is all about the fact that Jesus says, no, it's an inside job. It's not an outside job. It's not based upon external things. In fact, they tried to force his hand after he fed the people on the other side of the Sea of Galilee. And, and they tried to capture him and make him do what they wanted him to do. And he said he wouldn't have anything to do with it. That's when he said it's, it's an inside job. And so, Jesus <clears throat> begins to talk to them. And he begins to talk to them in paradoxical ways. What's well, a paradox? It's a statement that seems to contradict itself, but it speaks of a truth. It speaks of truth. And remember, this time, he's, that's, he's, that's all he's been doing. In, in, the, in the Sermon on the Mount, he's given one paradox after another. And remember, that's, Jesus did that often. Um, Jesus said, if you want to be first, you've got to be last. The way up is down. The way to live is to die. So here, he's, he starts talking about poor, being poor in spirit, mourning. Uh, being meek, in fact. And that just, just didn't compute for these people. Meek was not something that it was a part of their vocabulary. And now he comes to the place and he says, be merciful. <laughs> and folks, that was so contrary to the way the people thought in that day. That was just not something that they, they talked about. The, the Greeks and the Romans admired justice and courage and discipline, but not mercy. In fact, you can kind of learn a lot about mercy, uh, of what people thought about mercy, just by a statement that Aristotle made, speaking of slaves. He said, he said slaves were living possessions. We can do with them whatever we, we want to do. And certainly that was true. If you, was a, if you were a slave owner, if you got tired of a slave, you, got, you didn't like a slave, you would just kind of send him away to become dinner at, in the arena for some beast that evening. If uh, one slave got too old to really be productive, you simply could discard him just like you would an old wooden hammer. Babies weren't in a lot greater shape if a baby was born either a girl or a crippled boy. The father could stand over the baby, and the father did this, they kept the baby. If the father did this, the baby was killed, discarded. No, no questions asked. No questions asked. An enemy, the only good enemy was a dead enemy. There's no such thing of extending mercy to an enemy. A popular Roman philosopher called mercy the disease of the soul. Mercy was a sign that you didn't have what it took to be a man, you're weak. So our Lord says, listen, I know you want to be happy. But the only way I can tell you, the only road map I can give you is this road map. And it's not the way you think. And that's what we learn as we walk and live in the word of God. We learn that God doesn't think the way we think. He tells us that, in fact, as far as the heavens are from the earth. Or his thoughts from our thoughts. And so he says, here's the road map. If you really want to be happy, it's not an easy one. It's a road less traveled, no less. But it's the road to happiness. 
And he says the next stop on that is mercy. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 5. Let's read that verse together. In verse 7, we last, last week we, we looked at verse 6. It said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. In verse 7 it says, blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Now the first thing that we need to answer in, in terms of the meaning of mercy, and that's the question perhaps, is what is the meaning of mercy? Let's say what it's first not. Let's identify what it's not. Mercy is not overlooking sin. It's not saying, hey, everybody's okay. There was a psychologist, secular psychologist that came out a number of years ago with this philosophy. I'm okay, you're okay. And so that's kind of pervaded our society today. Hey, we're okay. you're okay. We're not always okay. That's not what it means. It doesn't mean to, to wink at sin. When God told Saul, King Saul, to kill the Amalekites, to wipe them out, Saul had a better idea, right? He let the king, King Agag, live. And so essentially God was saying, these are the people who killed my people, who destroyed my people, who hurt my people. They're evil people. And so what Saul was doing, Saul was a false mercy, not a real mercy. David had a false mercy. When David failed to deal with Absalom because of his sin, when he kind of winked at it, overlooked it, and essentially, that only served to affirm Absalom's sin. So the, the basic idea of mercy is, it's a Greek word which means to give help to the miserable. The Greek word has, can be traced back to the Hebrew and the Aramaic. Uh, the Hebrew word is kisada. And it's a un, really an untranslated word, untranslatable word. You really can't capture it in one word. It doesn't mean, get this, it doesn't mean just to be sympathetic with someone. It doesn't mean just to have compassion on someone. No. Let me give you what it means. It means the ability to get right inside other people until you can see things with their eyes, think things with their minds, and feel things with their feeling or feelings. Listen, mercy is compassion and grace with feet. Mercy is compassion and grace with feet. In other words, it takes action. It goes into play. It's not just something that we feel for someone else. We feel for that person over there. I really feel for that person. I'll pray for them. And we go on. It, 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 listen, it's, it's feeling for the, that boy down the street who is suffering from a broken home even though he has shattered your, the window to your garage more than once. I read a story this week that illustrates this so well. I tried to share it with Debbie last night and I couldn't get through the story. The story is that this family went to Disney World and they were at the, you know, it's the castle, Cinderella's castle, and they were looking for a place to sit down, to rest. He said, so were many others. Until finally, something happened, and everybody shifted to the other side of the castle. Cinderella showed up. He said, if it was a ship, it would have tipped over. He said, now my side of the castle is empty, except for one small boy. He's standing there holding his brother's hand. He's six, seven years of age. He has, he's dwarfed by the other kids, and he has a deformed face. And the guy that told the story said, you knew what he was thinking. You knew that he thought, I would love to be a part of the kids who are there now, because now Cinderella is hip deep in a garden of kids, and they're all wanting to touch her and for her to touch them. But the little boy is standing watching, and you know that he's fearful because he's probably been embarrassed and hurt many times before, and though he wants to be right in the middle of them. And the man who wrote the story, told the story, said, if only Cinderella would see him. He said, then all of a sudden, 
her eye caught this boy. In the moment her eye caught this boy, she made a beeline to that boy, carefully and gently, but nonetheless shedding children as she went. <laughs> and she knelt down right in front of him, looked him eyeball to eyeball, and kissed him on the cheek. <laughs> Can you imagine the feelings that went through that boy like a power surge when she came and kissed him and said, you are of value, you are of importance. That's compassion. That's mercy. In fact, it's the same mercy and compassion that God and Christ has extended to us. Is it not? Who came to this world and knelt down and looked us in the eye and said, in spite of who you are, in spite of your deformity spiritually, I love you. You're of value to me. Some have understood this passage, this statement, to mean do unto others as you would like them to do unto you, and they will do it. But is that true? Now, we, we know that what you sow, you reap, and it is true that it, the how you treat people often is, will be how they will treat you back. But is that really what Jesus is saying here? Because it's not always true. That's half-truth. We know when Jesus, when after Peter cut off the ear of, of the Roman soldier and Jesus picked it up and glued it back on the side of his head, the Romans still crucified Jesus, did they not? They didn't say, well, he's not such a bad guy after all. No. So does it really mean that? Another view is that you should do unto others as you would like God to do unto you. In this case, this beatitude really is looking at it from the standpoint that it, as you are good to other people, as you treat other people well, God will in turn bless you back. But is God an investment broker? No. You can't earn God's mercy. We are, we are the object of his mercy. And mercy in itself means you can't earn it. There was a guy that went and had his picture made, and as he was walking out, looking at the photo, he, he realized how bad a picture it was. And so he ran back into the see the photographer, and he said, look at this picture of me. It doesn't do me justice. <laughs> and the photographer looked at the picture and then looked at him. He said, <laughs> said man, with a face like yours, you don't need justice. You need mercy. <laughs> Folks, we don't need justice. We deserve justice. But we need mercy. And others need it as well. So, if, if we can't earn mercy from, the, from people through God by treating people right, then what does this mean? What does it mean in verse 7? It says, blessed are the merciful. Well, it means this. His teaching is, we should do unto, uh, unto others as God in his grace and mercy has done unto us. We can't buy mercy. Now, let's follow, let's, let's connect the dots again. Let's walk through the steps of what we've been seeing we, in, in the Beatitudes. First, we are poor in spirit. We recognize our depraved nature. We accept God's assessment of us, Right? Then we mourn. What, do, what does mourn mean? Does it mean we live in despair over our sin? No. But it does mean that we take our sin seriously. As I've said before now, we treat sin like we treat germs. What do we do with germs? Man, we, we, you know, we can't wait to get our hand sanitizer out, can we? When we shake somebody's hand or after, especially if they've got a cold or whatever, we, we shake their hands and we're, we're, we've got the hand sanitizer and we're, you know, and then we've, we're rubbing all over our bodies. That's the way we ought to treat sin. We should take it seriously. And, the, and the, the point here is that now that you've done that, you really, uh, you, after you understand God's assessment of, of you, of me, then we're humble. There's humility. There's no room for pride. There's no room for arrogance. And then once you do that, then you recognize, you recognize now that you're in need to, to pursue God's righteousness or his rightness. Rightness. Christ's rightness. In other words, live a life of integrity spiritually. 
realizing that everything you do, God is watching. And, and you play to only one person, to the applause of one, not anybody else. And then here's the next. Once you do that, you realize, hey, I'm engulfed in this ocean of grace, mercy. And my only response can be is that of treating others in mercy. When I get on my high horse and I start judging people, and I do that, we all do that. God says something's wrong with that picture. And folks, let me say, mercy is more than just compassion. It's more than just feeling for someone or empathy. It's forgiveness. It's forgiveness. Oh, I wish you didn't go there. But I want to show you today, I'm going to show you today that some of the greatest freedom that one can have is the freedom of forgiving and extending mercy to those who don't deserve it, who perhaps have hurt you. In Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 and 5, it says, But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. We, we all know the story of Joseph. We know that story, right? He, he was discarded. In fact, he was left for dead then the, by his brothers. And then they said, well, maybe we shouldn't do that. Maybe we should get some money out of him. We sell him. And, of course, you know the story. He, is, he, he goes to Egypt. There's a lot of things that happen to him. He gets thrown in jail. But finally, he becomes the second in command under Pharaoh. And his brothers show up. And his brothers are at his mercy. And that's a, exactly what Joseph did. In his mercy, he wept for their miserable condition. In his mercy, he extended, he met their physical need. And in his mercy, he restored them to a relationship with him because he forgave them. By the way, how many of you have had, heard that story and read that story many times? and have never connected the dots. Did you know that's a picture of, of Jesus? That Joseph is an Old Testament picture. Typology is what we call it in theology, but I call it a you know, picture, a, a silhouette, if you will, of Christ, who saw us in our miserable con condition. He wept over our miserable condition. And he came to the earth and cross and met our need, and he restored us to a relationship because of his forgiveness. That's the picture. Incredible stuff. I mean, great stuff. But what about the evidence of mercy? See, once I understand all of this, under, once I understand my condition, I walk through these steps, then I'm filled with joy about God's mercy to me. And so I recognize that I don't have a choice. I really don't have a choice as to whether I extend mercy to someone else. When I step across that line, I say, I accept Christ as my Savior, and I receive his bountiful gift. I give up my rights. I give up my rights to cling to those things that we cherish often. You see, the point here that, that Jesus is pointing out here, and don't miss this, is the proof that we have obtained mercy is that we do what? We show mercy. Right? Jesus taught a parable. You know the parable, don't you? There's a man who owed a, a king a, a, a 10,000 talents. And the king calls him in to, to reconcile that, basically make him pay up. And 10,000 talent, talents is a hypothetical number. Because you see, it would take 20 years for the average worker during that day to earn one talent, 10,000 talents. In fact, in the five regions of the Jewish regions of that day, the Roman government only collected a little bit over 800 talents a year. He can't pay this back. 
And so what does the king say? He says, you sell your wife, sell yourself, sell your children. Now, a slave in that day would go for somewhere between, two, in terms of our dollars, somewhere between $200 and $1,000. That's it. Nowhere close. And yet, you know the story. Basically, what he owed would be equivalent to $30 million in our dollar, $30 million plus, perhaps. And so the king, he pleads for forgiveness, and the king forgives him. You know, you, you know this. And then what does he do? He goes out and he grabs someone who owed him $30 by the throat. He says, hey, pay me back. And the word gets back to the king. And the king calls him in, and he says, you, you wretched guy. I forgave you of all this, and you can't forgive $30? Now, what happened? And, and, and don't forget that we're going to visit that statement in a moment. The last statement, he says, is that the king turned him over to the tormentor. No one knows what that means. I'm going to tell you what I think it could mean at the end of the message. But you see, he failed to enter into the experience. He, although he was forgiven, he didn't experience that, that forgiveness. It never made the transformation or the transfer from here to here. Debbie and I, um, when we moved here uh, from Ohio, some, they had this deal at Kroger's that you could buy a year pass discounted at Six Flags very cheaply. So we bought five passes, one for each person in the family. Our children took their passes and they went and you had to go to Six Flags and, and cash them in, but you had a pass for a year. They, they did that. Debbie and I never went that year to cash in our pass. We thought, well, maybe we ought to do this. And so the, I, after the next year I went down there and said, you know, we didn't use it. Could we cash it in? Sure. I just went to the box office. They cashed, said, sure, we can use it this year. We never used it. You say, what in the world is wrong with you? You didn't want to go to the... Well, listen, we OD'd on Disneyland and we were in California. And we OD'd on Cedar Point, which is the, the roller coaster capital of the world. I don't care if I never see another roller coaster in my life. My kids used to make me ride those roller coasters with them. And I'm surprised I didn't have a heart attack. You see, we don't know what it means to experience. We had the ticket, but we don't know what it means to experience Six Flags over Georgia. I, I don't know if it's good or bad. It's not made a difference in my life. You get the point? This guy who was forgiven had the ticket, and yet it never transformed his life. Here's the, here's the point. Many believers, and I'm guilty of it myself. I, I, I'm preaching to me first. Many believers traffic in unfelt truth, especially in this area. We never enter in to the blessing of God's bountiful gift. The parable is the story of us all. Our Lord said, listen, you can, you can live a, a, a thousand lives and you can never pay me back what you owe me. That's why I've set you free. And he says to the religious, pious person who walks around, he says, Listen, you look at the person who's down and out. You look at the person who's broken by sin, whose life has been shattered by the stupid mistakes they've made. But those are not the problem, people who are, who've got the problem. It's the religious, self-righteous person who says, man, I'm glad I'm not like that guy. You see, when we stand and look at the down and outer and we have no compassion for them. Jesus stands by and says, isn't there something wrong with this picture? When we look at the person who has hurt us and we cherish our bitterness and our anger and we, want, we think about all the time how they just, they haunt us day and night. And we, don't let, we won't let go of that bitterness. Jesus stands there and says, 
Isn't there something wrong with this picture? Really? Really? When someone is wrong and they, they, they've, they've disagreed with us and we want to straighten them out, we don't like being disagreed against, usually insecurities. And so we, we cling to that. We were just waiting for the opportunity to straighten them out again. And Jesus says, really? Really? There's something wrong with that picture. When we write people off who've blown it, we discount them. We don't give them the benefit of the doubt. Jesus says, really? Really? There's something wrong with this picture. See, Jesus was saying, listen, it's not rocket science. It's not hard to figure out. If I have forgiven you, if I've poured out mercy on you, and by the way, you're drowning in an ocean of mercy. You're not just floating, you're drowning. How about your heart? A forgiven person is a forgiving person. A forgiven person is a forgiving person. James chapter 2 says, For the judgment will be merciless to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Hmm. When John Wesley was missionary to Georgia, Governor uh, James Oglethorpe had a slave who stowed his whiskey, wine, whatever it was, and he drank it. And Oglethorpe wanted him punished, wanted him beaten. And so John Wesley, you've heard of John Wesley. He's the one who started the, the Methodist movement, the Wesleyan movement. Great missionary and preacher. He came to Oglethorpe and he tried to plead his case and asked him to forgive. And, and Oglethorpe says, I never forgive. I want vengeance. To which Wesley said, I hope to God, sir, you never sin. Hmm. Wow. When we stand in judgment, and I'm guilty of it, I'm preaching to me first. When we stand in judgment of others, we look down our noses at them and say, we basically stand where God stands, as if we'd never sin. That's heavy stuff. But it's the truth, is it not? Can you show me differently? I don't think so. What about the practice? What does it look like? Obviously, the Good Samaritan showed mercy to the, the guy in the gutter who was bleeding, beaten up. Abraham showed mercy when he rescued his nephew Lot from the king of Elam, even though, even though he didn't deserve it. Mercy led Joseph to forgive his brothers and to provide food for them. Mercy led Moses to plead with God to remove the leprosy from his sister Miriam, who was disciplined because of her rebellious ways. And of course, the greatest demonstration of mercy that we've ever seen was on the cross when Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Today we show mercy when we reach out to others around us who are deeply struggling in need of love and acceptance. They may be rough around the edges. They may be harsh and cruel even. And almost repulsive in their behavior. Uncouth. Yet they need love and mercy. Today we show mercy when we forgive someone else who has hurt us. William E. Sangster was the, the preacher in the uh, much loved preacher, in fact, of the renowned Westminster Central Hall in London. And one day he was, uh, before Christmas, he was preparing his, his cards, Christmas cards, like apparently they sent them out late back then. And one of his friends came to his house early and he noticed that uh, as he went he was watching him put stamps on these cards and then he saw one card with a name on it and his friend said you gonna send them a card <laughs> he said don't you remember 
And Sangster said, yes, I remembered 18 months ago when this person said something about me that hurt me. But he said, I worked through it with God's grace and God's, God's ability that helped me to forgive him. And so he put the stamp on there. As I read that story, I wondered how many of us have we, how many of us have written people off of our Christmas list because we don't like them. Today, mercy stop, happens when we stop writing people off, when they don't live up to our expectation, when they don't do what we want them to do, when they don't join our group, our special group. I, I've, I've, I've had people, I, I'm, I'm amazed at this, but I've had people tell me over the years, Byron, I've had people not speak to me in church. I've seen this everywhere. I've had people not speak to me in church because I didn't join their group. I didn't join their ministry. They wanted me to be a part of their ministry. And then they won't speak to me when I said, I, I can't do that. And someone else said to me, Byron, I'm, I'm going to brag on my wife. I know some of you do this as well, so it's not just my wife, but I'm going to brag on her. You know, someone said to me once, said, Byron, I appreciate how Debbie approaches people with, for Judgment House. When she says, I, I, I'd like for you to consider doing this. But if you can't do it, that's fine. We're, we're okay with that. We want what, who, the people that God wants here to do that. And if you can't find time, that's okay. James 3.17. One of my favorite verses. says, but the wisdom from above is first pure. In other words, pure motive. Then peaceable. Gentle. Reasonable, full of mercy, good fruits, unwavering without hypocrisy. And I want us to go back, back to that phrase, full of mercy. What does that mean? I was leading a group of pastors in Ohio on a, in a Bible study one time, and we were studying on this, and, I, and we walked through this passage. And I said, what does that mean? And one pastor said, that means giving others the benefit of the doubt. That's mercy. Mercy is giving others the benefit of the doubt. John, you remember John? John says, in fact, you tie, you tie John 1 with 1 John. And you pull it together and you see John who says, I've seen the Lord. I've seen the Lord. Not only have I seen the Lord, I've touched him. And guess what? He's full of grace and truth. He's full of truth and grace. And the Bible says that grace and truth kissed at the cross. That's what Jesus was. Now what about the reward? Well, look at the passage here. The reward says, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Now what's it mean again? It doesn't mean that if I'm merciful to others, God will bless me for, or, or, or something like that. That's not what he's saying. But it is saying that when I experience his mercy, and I in turn treat others in mercy, I receive what? More mercy. Mercy that's overflowing. Well, what does that mean in terms of just every day? It means that God in his mercy extends not only his mercy to me, but he even holds back discipline for my sins when I deserve it. It's basically God's cycle of mercy. It begins by recognizing who, what, what Christ has done for us. In, in recognizing that we, are, we mourn over our sin, we, rec, we, we call sin, sin. And then we're humbled by that. And then we extend mercy to others. We forgive. One of the hardest things to do is to forgive. But I want to tell you that what Jesus is saying here is God's prescription for peace and satisfaction. I believe this with all my heart. I have been in, in ministry long enough and have counseled people long enough that when the, there is something that, that's, that's about healing, when you re release someone from your judgment, from your whatever it may be, lack of forgiveness. I remember as a young man working as a presser in the dry cleaners, I've told you about that. I remember someone as a young man had said something to me that hurt me. And as I was in back, back in the back of that dry cleaners, this hot, sweat, sweaty box, 
I would think through what I would love to tell that person. And the more I would think through it, the more when I bring that thing down that would press the things, the more I would hit these the two levers on the top. And the more I think about it, the harder those things. And I was just hanging on to my cherishing, my anger, and my bitterness. Then finally I said, I realized I've got to go do something. I've got to go to this person and ask them to forgive me. And I did. And that person <laughs> threw it right back in my face. Right back in my face. I said, I'll, I'll pray for you. I said, well, I need prayer. Now, that's not what I would have said many years before that. But there was something that was freeing about that that I've never forgotten. Let me give you three applications here. Mercy means I become a naturalized citizen of, another, of another's world. I become a naturalized citizen of another's world. Mercy means I set people free from my preconceived expectation of what they should do or be. Mercy means having a heart ready to forgive. Why? Because we've been forgiven. The story is told of a, of a young man who was from a small town who had embarrassed his parents in, his, in the small town because of something he did criminal. He went to jail. He never heard from his parents. Now, his parents were illiterate, so he didn't know if that, that was why he didn't hear from them or if they, it was another problem. And so finally, a few weeks before he was about to be released, he wrote his parents. He said, I'm, I'm coming home. I'm going to be on a train. And, of course, the train went right by their property. He said, if you forgive me, if you forgive me, Please hang a white ribbon on the apple tree in our backyard. And so he's on the train, and he's in this car with this other guy, and he's telling him about what happened. And, and, and by the way, he hasn't hurt after he sent that letter. He didn't hear anything from his parents, not a thing. So he didn't know. And as he wrote them, he says, if you forgive me, if you put that ribbon there, I, I'll know you forgive me. But if you don't, I'll, I'll be out of your life the rest of, rest of your days. And so he told this guy on the car, in the car, on the train, and the, the, he, said, he told them what had happened. And as he got close to his home, he said, he moved away from the window, and he said, I can't, I can't stand to look. He said, would you look for me? And as they round the curve, and as they approached the house, the man reached over and grabbed his leg. <laughs> he said, the tree is white with white ribbons. Folks, that's what Jesus did for us. That's what he hangs out for us. How can we not respond in like kind? Amen? Let's pray.